all of us have different versions of the Bible. Yeah, someone has got uh, ESV, I've got NASB, some have KJV, NKJV, NIV and God knows so many different versions and languages as well. We have Hindi, English, Marathi, Tamil, Malayalam, so on and so forth. So we have different versions of Bible for the same book. But if the world and the Christians or the church is just two versions of the same thing, then the church is actually contradicting its real identity. It's not able to match up with the identity that, the, that how the church should be. And if somebody comes and says, well, you're no different from anybody else, then that is the most condescending and worst comment that a Christian or a church can get. So the world comes and says, or some, someone comes and says, you are just as anyone else. You're no different than anyone else then that's, as I said, the most condescending and most insulting comment that we can get in our life. Just uh, came across a story where a boy, a, a young boy, who was, was taken to the church for the first time by a lady. I don't know, it's a, it is a real story, but I don't remember the name and all. Um, someone had uh, shared it in the, in fact, our... The, the college uh, director where I studied, uh, Dr. Paul Pillay, who went away to be with the Lord uh, a couple of days ago, he had once in a chapel service, he said, he shared the story of somebody, um, I don't know, the boy's name was a Braun or Bone, something like that. So this boy was taken to the church for the first time in his life. And he was sitting over there with a lady that who had taken him. And uh, he heard somebody talking about someone on this pulpit talking about someone who was brutally beaten up and and uh, tortured and uh, nailed on the cross he was bleeding he died and so on and so forth so this boy was feeling so upset about all that thing and he thought when the past three the the person standing on the front in the front is talking about such bad things taking place with a with a man then everyone is now going to get up and say, we are going to avenge that person. But nothing happened. Everyone was sitting quietly and looking at the person standing in front and uh, narrating all these things. So the boy was wondering why nobody is feeling bad. Why am I the only person who's feeling bad about such bad things being done to a person? And he the thing continued was killed and everything the story went on and uh, he was so so touched by it he was so moved by it and he was moved by both the things that that somebody was tortured brutally and at the same time he was also sad that nobody else felt anything about it he thought okay at the end of the sermon everyone will say let's go together and take care of this but nothing happened at the end of this whole thing as well and he, this boy started crying like anything he started crying and thinking about what all that thing has hap happened to that person who was uh, hung on that, uh, that tree with nails piercing his hands and legs and bleeding and all. So the lady who was with him, he said, shh, quiet, don't cry. People will mock at you, they'll laugh at you. Why are you crying? Don't cry. So this boy was wondering, why is this lady asking me not to cry when something so horrible has taken place? Now that's the situation with us as church. We are not at all moved. We are like the mountain, which will never be moved. And if somebody is moved, we find that person to be funny, awkward, odd, we sometimes make fun of that person. Somebody is moved by the, the, the sermon or the prayer and they start crying. At the end of the service, someone might walk up to them. What happened? Why were you crying? Making that feel, person feel a little more embarrassed. As if he has sinned. The person has made, committed a sin by crying in the church. Something really embarrassing has taken place. Aren't we meant to show emotions? 
we, if we really want to see emotions, we should go to a church where 90% of the crowd is illiterate. I'm sure many of us must have had experiences in such churches where 90% of the crowd is illiterate and, and at a very low strata of life. We find them emotional like anything. I remember once in, in somewhere in Rajasthan, we were showing the movie called Daya Sagar. I don't know how many of you remember that movie still. It's now outdated. Nobody knows that there was a movie like that. And uh, we were showing this. There was this, this uh, film show was going on. And uh, a church from, from Udaipur had gone. Um, and they were showing this movie. And uh, they, you, they used to have those roles, those movie reels, uh, which would rotate and then the movie gets displayed. So when, when, the, when the crucifixion scene came and the beating and torturing and all, the crowd was crying like anything. As if their own somebody was, someone from their family was getting beaten up and tortured. Crying like anything. And suddenly, the, you know, that's a, that was a common issue all the time when we had those movies going on. The tape gets snapped. The reel gets snapped. So they were all like, oh, now what? So the pastor was leading it. He went out and said, see, there, after this, it's just uh, uh, Jesus resurrects. And uh, so that's, that's how it is. So would you like us to, do, is that okay or do you want us to fix it because it will take some time? They said, we'll sit. And they fixed the reel and played it. The rest of it was played. And finally, when, when the, 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 uh, the cave was broken up, the, 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 the stone was moved and Jesus came out, when that scene came, these people jumped up and roared like anything as if the heaven is going to fall down now. That much noise they made. And all of them were tribal people. So that's what I said. If you want to see emotions, if you want to see people moving, we need to go to some place where their 90% of them is illiterate or the literate also feel that we are illiterate as the word of God says, consider yourself as fools. If we consider ourselves as fools, then we will be moved by what the word of God says. It, it, we are made to be different, to, to listen to and hear and act according to what the God's word says. And we are really made different, set apart to be different in taking Christ and his word seriously. When that child took that matter of Christ seriously he cried and filled with anger and pain and everything all the emotions came out of the child because he took it seriously but when we sit and hear about the passion of Christ about the crucifixion of Christ priests church pastors and all preach about all those nails very dramatically they will tell us that it was pierced and it blood gushed out and kind of things then pastors say we'll sit and what's wrong Nice oratory skills. We'll sit and appreciate the oratory skills of the pastor. That's what we do. So are we not supposed to be different as Christians? Now when we talk about Christ, uh, uh, diff, being different, the Greek word for holy is, is uh, hagios. And uh, it's, it, it, it means fundamentally separated okay it, it means separated and uh, which means separated from sin and consecrated for God in the Old Testament again we have the word Kadosh and the related words to it have the same meaning as separated like in 2nd Corinthians 6 17 it says come out from them and be separate says the Lord Says they will go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean things, then I will welcome you. He says, go out of there, separate yourself, and keep yourself clean. So there's a separation made from the world. 
And so, if we if we look at the word, the biblical word holy, um, in, in a contemporary language, it would mean it would mean different. As I started with the topic title of my my sermon, it would mean different. So, a holy person is not some someone who's odd. The child is not odd. The child who cried at that sermon is not odd. He is just different. And that different is what is meant by holy in the word of God. So that's what Jesus says. Until and unless you become like this child, you will not see the heavens. You will not see the word kingdom of God if you don't become like this child. That is, you become different. You become holy like the child. Then you see the word of the heavens or the kingdom of God. And these holy people that we are have a unique quality in us. That is, their lifestyle is not just different from their past lifestyle. There is a change. Like we sing the song, great change since I was born. There's a great change since I was born. We know in Sunday school we learn those, those, those lines of what all areas we had change taking place in our life. So there is a change that takes place from the past life to the present life. But also there is a life, there is a different lifestyle from the world around us. The lifestyle itself is different from the world around us. So, because, as I mentioned, a holy person always takes Christ seriously. If that seriousness about Christ is lost, somewhere down the line, we need to rethink about our faith life. We need to rethink about it. Romans 12, 1 and 2, these were the two verses that I had focused earlier when I started. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to be separate. We need to be away from, set apart from the world. We need to be transformed. Do not be conformed to this world. The word world is, the, the, the word used for world is um, ion, which is also translated as age or the time or the period or the era. And when we talk about an age or era, we don't talk about the period of period in, on calendar. We talk about the, the thought patterns, the uh, attitude of the people of that a particular age. When we talk about era or age. So rejecting the pattern of this world does not mean that we live in isolation. That okay, like we, we hear about hermits and all who go to Himalayas or who go to the top of a long, tall tree, make a uh, set up over there and sit over there so I'm not in touch with the world at all. That is not what it means. When it talks about separation, God doesn't want us to be in isolation as, as hermits. Away from the world and away somewhere else where we do not have any contact with the, with the world is not what God means when he says set apart and be different and separated. Instead, the word of God says that you are the salt and the light to the world. It says you are the salt and the light to the world. So if you are salt and light to the world, how can it be possible if you are sitting somewhere else? If you are salt to a curry, if you are set apart in a, in a container on the top portion of the shelf, how can you be a salt to that curry that is being made? You cannot be. You have to get out of that, come into this. Then only you become the salt of that curry. So if you, are to, if you are to be the salt of the earth, you need to be here, in the world, in the earth. If you are the light to the world, you have to come to the light to the world. Sitting somewhere else with your light over there doesn't help. You cover the, it, 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 the, it says you don't, you don't light up a candle and then cover it up with something. That okay, this is my light, 
I should not get mixed up with the world outside. I should not get mixed up with the darkness outside. So let me cover myself. No, that is not what it talks about. What it talks about is that you are a part of this world. You be in this world and practice being different. And practice being separate. You be in the salt, continue to be the salt, continue to taste like salt and be in the curry. You be in the darkness, continue to be the light. You don't become the darkness. You be in the world, not world in you. The difference lies over there. Am I in the world? God, God said, I place you in this world. I keep you in this world. I leave you in this world. But God didn't say, I leave the world in you. The word never says, I leave the world in you. But what, that is where we go wrong. We are kept in the world, but we are keeping the world in us. And when that happens, things go astray. Things go astray. We are no longer different from the world. Leviticus 18.3 says, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. Clearly, clear instructions are given that you are not supposed to do the way you were or the people around you were doing. And you are not even supposed to do what the Gentiles of the place where you I'm taking you also, you should be doing. So I'm taking you out of one place, leave those things over there. I'm going to put you in one place, leave their things also over there itself. Don't, we don't, don't say that, okay, this is God's will. God has brought me out of there. So I had, I was supposed to leave all those practices and everything, the faith, belief, everything over there. Now he has brought and put me into this place. So I am supposed to practice, to inculcate everything that is of this place. We, we use the, 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 the instruction out of context saying, I became all for all so that I may win some. So, which means to win a drunkard, I need to become a drunkard. To win a gambler, I need to become a gambler. And probably if I want to win a murderer, then I need to murder somebody as well. The word of God says, I became... So to win somebody, I need to become like that. That means now, as, as I had earlier, I don't know whether here or somewhere else I would mentioned, I quoted this. If I want to raise somebody, somebody has fallen into the pit. Someone has fallen into the pit. And I want to raise that person. And I go and say, come, give me your hand. I'll raise you out. Will that person give me his hand? He's down in the pit and I'm standing over here and I say, give me your hand. I'll raise you out of the pit. Will he give me his hand? Yes. He will give me his hand. Because he knows I'm standing up there and I am in a position that I could help him. Oh no. Paul says, I became all for all. So what do I do? I see somebody in the pit and I also jump into the pit. And I say, yes, give me your hand. I'll raise you up. Will he give me his hand? No. So if I am like the world, if I look like the world, if I seem like the world, there's no difference at all. Why would somebody come to meet them? Why would somebody want to practice what I am practicing? And what he should practice that you are practicing? Because you are already practicing what he is practicing. So what is the difference then? We are doing what he is doing. Jesus told his followers, do not be like them. In Matthews, he says, do not be like them. Complete clear instructions given. Jesus did not want his followers to be like the heathens, the Gentiles. Or to be the, like the religious leaders of those times. He's comparing those religious leaders of that, those times. So how, how, to, how are we supposed to be different? Further, when we go down in the chapter 12, we find how we are supposed to be different. Paul tells the Ephesians that no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. 
as the rest of the Gentiles walk, do not walk like them. Leviticus 18.4, it says, You shall follow my rules and, my, and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. So how to be different? You have to follow my rules, keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. When you do that, you are actually being different from the world because the world doesn't do that. The world doesn't follow my rules. The world doesn't keep my statutes. The world doesn't walk in them. And the world doesn't accept me as their Lord. So when you do dif these different things, these things that are different from the world, you are already different. You are practicing different. When you go down in Romans 12, 3 to 9, uh, 3 to uh, Nah, eight. It talks about for the for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Clearly says to be equal, to be to consider yourself equal to the others. Among the brethren, this is talking about among the brethren that you consider yourself to be equal to others and others as well do not think that you are something higher something bigger something greater than the other person just because somebody sins differently from me he's not a bigger sinner than me all of us what bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the grace so that includes all. Now who am I to condemn some, somebody who has sinned differently from me? I too sin, the other person also sins, but no, 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 that sin, I don't commit that kind of a sin. Okay, I do something different, but not that. Oh my goodness, oh man, that's so bad. I, I, I bitch about my brother, I bitch about my sister, I talk ill about everyone else. But you know what? That person, that brother, he was smoking so bad. Smoking is a bigger sin. What I am doing, that's okay, no. That's a holy sin. There, there's a level of sin, no? Holier, holy sin and unholy sin. So whatever I do is a holy sin and whatever somebody else does is, a, is an unholy sin. So that is why I've been by default given a right to condemn somebody who is committing an unholy sin while I am fine with the holy sins that I commit. But the word of God doesn't say so says, do not consider yourself higher than the others. Everyone has been assigned a measure of faith. God has assigned it to them. For as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. In one body, we have many members, hands, legs, eyes, that is external body parts and the internal body parts. Everything has got a different function altogether. The intestines are not going to drag me out to office every day. It's my legs that will take me. My feet that will take me to the office. Right? So, so there, everyone has a different role to do. And there is no, nothing unholy or holy in our body. Everything has its own place, has its own part to play. People, we have different... Um, um, we all the members are different but that different doesn't mean higher or lower there's no difference of higher and lower if that was then jesus would not have done what he did and what we practice every 31st of december if there was a difference he would have said okay see um see i am the head i'm the son of god i'm the head so i cannot be a part of it and then i have the 12 people who are right under me they are the, like deacons and uh, the main bishops and all those sort of things. So I am the I am the Pope kind of a level, and these are all my bishops and all or whatever the, the categories are there. 
uh, and so they will be seated and uh, so all these 12 disciples will come and wash my feet and then all these 12 disciples will sit and the rest of the people will come and wash the feet of the 12 disciples that would have been what would have been done if God Jesus wanted us to feel ourselves to be different from others don't we look at people with a different eye we do we are guilty of that we are guilty of that that we look down on somebody and we look up at somebody the word of God also says it clearly says that you people do that when somebody comes dressed in nice clothes you make him sit besides you and when somebody enters with tattered clothes you say go and sit in that corner the word of God says that it's written in the Bible don't we do that we also do that if not so explicitly at least in a hidden manner in our thoughts we do that but the word of God doesn't want us to do that Christ does not want us to do that we're having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith if service in our serving the one who teaches in his teaching the one who exhorts in his exhortation the one who contributes in generosity the one who leads with zeal the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness we heard yesterday those who are here we heard about the gifts that we should pray for various gifts but once we give those get those gifts let's not start classifying it this is the higher gift and this is the lower gift someone has a gift of sitting alone in the house and praying oh, that's a what someone has a gift he just goes around and people i don't know a lot of things happen that's something great great man of god what is happening when he raises his hand people blah, 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 they all fall down so he's a great man and some person is sitting in the corner of that room in his house or her house sitting then and there and praying like last time i said when i preached last last to last sunday said so there was an 80 year old lady who kept praying god send dl moody to my church She is not great. What, what greatness? She just sat there and prayed. That's all she did. But this man, he came onto the stage. He was jumping like fire. He was going up and down and up and down. The stage was about to break. That much power of spirit was there. Huh? If the stage is breaking, then that means that much spiritual power that man has got. If the stage does not break, oh, well, not, not good. The preacher was not effective. What effect do you want? <laughs> what kind of effect are we looking at? There is nothing greater or smaller. None of the gifts are great or small. Each one has been given a measure and each one has been given a gift according to the measure that God has assigned. The moment you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I've spoken about the baptism of the Holy Spirit a long time ago. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you do get a gift along with that. Now you have to identify which gift you have gotten. Many a times we never, never, never realize which is the gift that we got. Sometimes long years go by and you never realize what was the gift that I got. Because we have something in mind that these are the gifts. If prophecy came, oh yes, I got a gift. If tongues came, yes, I got a gift. If healing came, yes, I got a gift. No other gift. There are a lot of things mentioned in the Bible as gifts of God, gifts of the Spirit. But nothing else is realized as a gift. When these two, three things come out, say, oh yes, I have received the gift of the Spirit. But we need to identify what is the gift that we have received. All of us do receive the gift, but then we need to control. We need to make sure that we do not consider ourselves to be higher than somebody else. Jesus told the religious leaders of his time, he said, You are of this world. I am not of this world. He says about his disciples also, he says, that they are not of the world anymore. To God, he says, that these disciples that you have given to me, they are not any more of the world anymore than I am of the world. If I am of the world, they are of the world. If I am not of the world, then they are also not of this world. 
So the disciples that Jesus chose, or these, all the disciples of Jesus, are meant to be different and not of this world. Not of this world. Because the rules of the, the kingdom of the world is completely different, exactly opposite to the, 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 the rules of God's kingdom. That is why many times when we read the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes, we find it impossible, unrealistic, non-practical kind of things. Because it is absolutely opposite to what the world is and how the world functions. Whatever God's word says, whatever Jesus said on the mount is completely different from the way the world functions. But to those who wholeheartedly commit to the spirit of God and try to follow it, we do not, of course it's, it's difficult, it is, it is challenging, but still we continue to grow little by little, little by little, to reach up to that level. That is what God, the word of God wants. That is what God wants for us, from us. That we should keep growing until we reach the head. The body should keep growing till it reaches the proportion of the head. I don't know if you remember, I did a long time ago, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I probably, I, I spoke about when a child is born, the proportion is, the head is 1 by 4 of the body. 1 by 4 of the whole body. So it's like 1 is to 3 is the ratio. Head is one portion and rest is three portions. Now imagine when the, when the child grows, gets matured, growing up, the body ratio remains the same. How would the child look? See, if you cut my body part into four portions, I think, I think this, from the knees down till here, and then till here, and then till here. That's the four parts. Now imagine my head to be this big. This big head. Can we accept that child to be normal or that man to be normal when he grows up? No. What Jesus wants us is to grow, uh, that the body should grow to the level of the head. So the body should keep growing. The body should not remain that 3 is to 1 ratio. The body is to continue to grow up to 7 is to 1 ratio. Now the body situation is a normal body, a perfect body condition would be 1 eighth of the body part will be the head when you grow up. So unless you reach that, so if God is that, God has reached that level, then you have to reach that. Jesus is the head, then that head, according to that head, the body should grow. That is what the word of God wants. That is what the God, word of God tells us. That even though it is impossible, but we keep striving to reach that head. The body will never ever go above the head. If it happens, then everything is wrong. The body will never ever go above the head. The body will reach up to the head. And that is what is required of the church. That is what is required of believers as a church, as a body of Christ to reach that level of the head. That we become one. So we can come fairly close to living according to those beatitudes if we keep striving to do that. Continuing on the, in the 12th chapter, from 9 onwards, it says, let love be genuine. So how do we practice to be different? There are some, some symptoms, some marks, some signs of being different given in that, those verses from 9 onwards till 21 verse. It says, let love be genuine. Our love should be genuine. Is our love gen genuine? Only we will know it. Nobody else can tell us whether our love is genuine or not. Because we, we are very good actors. We are born actors. We are born actors. We can act very well. So we don't know. Nobody will be able to tell us that we are genuinely loving or not. So you only know whether you genuinely love. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. There is one place where where the word, word is saying that you do something more than somebody else, better than somebody else. 
You be something really better than somebody else is where he, it talks about in doing something honorable. In honoring the other, in showing honor, you be better than others. Otherwise, you consider yourself to be low. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. As I said, this is a sermon. Altogether, it itself is a sermon. That's why I'm just reading it out. Paul's sermon going on. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. That's something difficult. Never be wise in your own sight. We are always the opposite. We are always wise in our own sight. None of us, including me or the preachers, can say that, no, it is not like that. We always think ourselves to be wise. And when everyone has given suggestions, we always have a suggestion which is better than others, according to us. It may not be the better, best one. But according to me, the suggestion that I finally give is the best. So, which means I consider myself to be the wisest. But it says, don't do that. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. A complete message has come through. Sermon has come through to you. What are we supposed to do? How can we be different? How, what, are the, what are the marks that, that, or, or those litmus tests that we need to clear to call ourselves different from the world, given over there, in those verses? We can test every day to check, okay, do I match these? Do I match this? Do I match this? Where did I fail? You can make a checklist of this and keep it to check where are we, how are we faring? Why is it so important for us to be different? As I mentioned in the beginning, it is the fact that we are different that, that implores or challenges people or draws people towards us or draws unbelievers towards us is because we are different. We hear various, various testimonies from various people, um, especially people working in uh, organizations that are not belonging to, un to believers like Rajita works, Xavier works, and many other people. They come up, at times they, were, they come up with, with their testimony saying that somebody came to me and asked for my advice, sought my suggestions. Why? Why? Because they know that you are different. Because they know they will not get an advice, an, a, a godly advice or a sensible advice if they go to their smoking partners and drinking partners. They know they will not come to you for smoking and drinking. But whenever they have, they have a problem, they will definitely come to you. Because they know you are different. The difference is seen by people. And only when they see the difference will they come to you. That is only when you are the light of the world. When they see the light, then only they will come to you. If you are a non-burning candle kept somewhere, nobody is going to come to that place. But if someone finds, someone is working, walking in the darkness in the forest... And he sees a candle burning somewhere far away in a small hut. That person will keep looking at that and walking towards it. Because you are the light to the world. You are showing your difference. You are showing that I am not darkness. I am light. Even though everywhere around there is darkness, I am still burning as a light to the world. And that when seen, people are drawn towards us. That when seen, people come towards us. That challenges people, the unbelievers, to be drawn to us. 
and that helps us to be witnesses of Christ. If we continue to be conformed to the pattern of this world, then our, our allegiance is towards the world, or at least we are double-minded. If not completely towards the world, we have double-minded situation. And when we are in double-minded situation, it is difficult, it is next to impossible for us to stand up against the ungodliness that is so prevalent in our society today. We cannot stand up. When we, are, when we ourselves are in two minds, we cannot stand up against that situation, against the conditions that we are facing, against the problems that we, are, that we see in the world. We all spend, comparatively if we look at it, we all spend a very little time with godly things, with the Bible or Christians or Christian friends or fellowshipping with, with other, other believers and all. It's a very limited time. The maximum time we are battered by the world. And the worldly things. We kept being battered here and there. We come across our bosses who are always nagging, our, our colleagues who are always jealous with us or trying to pull our leg, trying to pull the, pull the chair behind us. They are always against so us. Things are always so much of troubles, problems are going on over there. We just have a little time when we are everything holy, holy, godly, and uh, peaceful, and uh, all those sort of things. A very, very little time. So if we need to be diff we need to be able to stand up against that situation we have to be radically different from the world only then we can stand up boldly against what is wrong so either we live by the world's rules or to 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 an extent that we reject god or we live at, according to the god's will to the extent that we reject the world both cannot be happening. Both cannot take place together. So what is the pattern of this world? Colossians 2.8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, an empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. It talks about, be careful that we are not led astray by the philosophical ideas and logical reasoning and all brought into sermons and teachings. We, we, we will come across. It's not something alien. If you are in this, this church or in this faith, you will come across people who will come to you and give you teachings that are more philosophical, more logical, and you'll start thinking, oh yeah, that's right, I never thought, it, thought of it like that. And we might get blown away like chaff. We might start flowing in that direction. The pattern of this world is, is now thrust upon us in a much greater degree than the older days. So much is there. Newspapers, radios, internet, billboards, a lot of things everywhere. Wherever you turn your face, you have something or the other which, which imposes the worldliness onto our head. Everything that is immoral is now being taught to us as normal, as natural. It's your wish. You want to wear clothes, you wear. If you don't want to wear clothes, don't wear. Who's asking you to do? That is also normal. You wearing clothes is also normal. Not wearing clothes is also normal. That's what it's telling us. If you go around, go around on the billboard, you, you on, on the highways, or not on the highways, in the cities itself, you find, you, you find on billboards, huge billboards, which is like 10 times of my size, you'll find models standing with scantily cl clad clothes. What does it tell me? That I should roam around like that? It's normal. If it, it is not meant to be inside the house, it's not to be meant, meant to be inside other clothes, it's to be to remain outside the clothes and outside the house. So go around. That's normal. That's what the world tells us. It talks us, tells us that greed is, 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 is normal, is the way of life. Selfishness and greed is encouraged today. You have a car, you have a car, this is but the advanced version has come. Go and exchange it. 
Don't our friends tell us when they see our phones, you have an iPhone 5? Six has come. Has it has it more one more? iPhone 7, 8 or something? 10. My goodness. So I am I'm very outdated. So if you had an iPhone 8, 9, your friend will say, You're still in 8, 9? 10 is there. Go and exchange it. They will tell you how to go about it as well. Greed, selfishness is encouraged in today's world. So when we see all these things, magazines, internet, videos, televisions, everywhere we are, like in, in, in Psalm 1 and 1 verse 1, it says, we are exposed to the counsel of the ungodly. We are exposed to the counsel of the ungodly with all these things that we see. And be very sure, the world is not neutral. It is completely against the will and the teachings of Christ. It will always teach you something that is against the will of God, against the teachings of God. And it's got a very subtle way sometimes of pushing it into yours, your life. That we'll see, and sometimes if I take up the first, uh, the, 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 the first sin of Adam and Eve's sin, how subtle, in a very subtle manner, the, the devil pushes it into our life. We'll, we'll talk about it sometimes later, but it's a very, very, uh, very cunning way that he does it. He gets into us. And hence, if we are not different, we will not be able to stand up against that assault of the world we will not be and why is it so difficult the the basic difficulty the basic challenge that we face is our greatest temptation is to please the world we are always looking at ways that we can please the world we do not want somebody to be hurt we do not want that's a very nice thing right? It's a very kind thing that we have, that I don't want to hurt anybody. But because of that, I'm hurting myself, I'm hurting Christ. But we, that priority is changing. About the re religious leaders also, uh, John says in his gospel, said, love the, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. In Luke 6.26, there's, there's, there's something really I don't know, very, very painful or very terrorizing it is. It says, woe to you when all people speak well of you. When people start speaking well of you, when people start speaking good about you, oh, you are a very nice person, you are a very sweet person, you are... then he says, woe to you. My goodness, is it really so? For so their fathers did to the false prophets. Because even for the false prophets also the same words were said. To the false prophets also, it said, you are very... Nice. You are very good. Your preaching is so interesting. Oh, it's so lovely to hear your preaching. Is what they said. Their forefathers said to the false prophets as well. Which means we need to take this very seriously. So, one of the major causes for our weakness is our desire to please the world. And because we have ignored the Romans 12 too, which says, do not be conformed to the world. And to follow that, to be conformed to the world, we are very good in twisting the word of God according to our convenience. We twist the word the way we want so that whatever I do is justified. And I am, nobody can blame me. How can we be different? Just by believing in the word of God. If we believe in the word of God, and we consider it as authoritative and take the word of God and Christ seriously. That will help us to be different. The 12.2, Romans 12.2 should be our basic of all conduct. Our basic rule of conduct. There are many people we are going according to worldly standards. Some people don't accept the Bible as an authoritative measure of conduct so if we don't accept it as authority authoritative measure of conduct then what is different there's nothing for us to stand according to if the bible is not 
instructing us what we are supposed to do as per God's will, then there is nothing for us to stand according to. So we need to accept the authority of the word of God. And then only we will be able to stand against the pressure of the world. So how do we do it? First, we have to make a conscious decision. We have to decide a conscious decision we have to make to, confirm, to not to conform to the world's standards. We know what the world's standards are and we have to make a completely informed decision that no, I am not going to be conformed to the world. Even if I face rejection and unpleasant comments or, or, or lewd comments at me, I will not. Because the word of God, because uh, Jesus said in John 15, 19, he said, because you're not of this world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So if you are of the God, the, the world will definitely hate us. The hatred will be seen if we are for God. If we are not for God, the world will praise us. You are very nice, very good. Like they did, their forefathers did for their the false prophets. The world hated Jesus and his disciples because they were not of the world. And the same would happen to us. Whom do you want to please? God or people? Because both cannot be possible all the time. We need to take our thoughts captive to obey Jesus Christ. We need to focus on the things of God. There is the good way or the best way to resist this pressure to confirm to the pattern of this world is, as I said, to make a conscious decision to focus our mind on Christ and his words. And seek those things. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, it says, seek those things which are above, where Christ, with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. That is going to help us. If our sight is somewhere else, we will not fall prey to what is right underneath our feet. But if our sight is not over there, where sight is around us, we will definitely fall prey for all those things that are surrounding us. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That is what is going to help us to be different. Because Jesus has set us apart to be different. So if we want to live in this secularized world, separate, then we need to make sure as it says in 12.2, Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to the world. And that, has, that really needs a lot of effort from us. It doesn't come easy. It will not be easy. We will only be able to do it when we continue to practice, 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 practice in face of all adversities, all challenges, all hurls, abused, abuses hurled us, at us and everything that comes against us. When we keep practicing it, it will become a habit, a Christian habit to be different as Christ has set us apart to be different, not of this world, but of another world. Just as Jesus was not of this world, we will also be not of this world if we practice it being not confirmed to the world. May God bless us through these words. Help us to continue not to be confirmed to this world and prepare our lives in such a manner that our eyes are open to how subtly the devil is trying to push us through to make us fall aside, to make us fall apart from the way that God has given us to walk in, the path that God has given us to walk in. So let us surrender ourselves. Let's continue to worship God as the team, worship team leads us in worship. Let us think about these words. Let us surrender our lives into his hands and prepare ourselves, asking God's grace because only with God's grace can we be different in this world. Without His grace, we will definitely fail 
us our abilities are never ever going to help us succeed in anything that god wants us or the according to live according to god's will may god bless us let's rise in our feet